Now to shares of Hancock Whitney, the regional bank moving lower after they beat on earnings for the third quarter, but said loan growth continues to moderate as, you guessed it, higher rates and insurance costs change consumer behavior. The company sees headwinds to future loan growth as well. Joining us now with more on the business is John Hairston, president and CEO of Hancock Whitney. John, it's great to have you here. I don't think you've been on before with us. Welcome. No, first time on the show. Thanks for including me. Down in, in the Gulf, as I understand it, uh, Mississippi area and so forth. And uh, we were hoping maybe you guys have a, a different and, and better read on the economy. It may be a stronger one, but it sounds like you are experiencing some slowdown trends. Well, it, de it depends on which part of the footprint. I'm actually in San Antonio today. Uh, we open up our first San Antonio office to the ribbon cutting this afternoon, in fact. So many of the markets across our footprint actually have been quite well and good for growth. Uh, the slower parts of our market typically have very low pressure during downtime. So it's a healthy balance of high growth markets and stable markets. How long have you been in the business? Because this is a question I feel like is becoming more relevant than ever. Those who have lived through a couple of cycles with high interest rates arguably are going to have better institutional memory than those that haven't. So uh, how do you compare banking in these times with uh, what you've previously been through or not been through? You know, it's a great point. Uh, when we look at the ages of bankers and credit people across the industry, it's shocking sometimes to realize how many of the gray hairs left <laughs> during the pandemic. So uh, I've been in the business for over 30 years. I've been at this company 29. So uh, no stranger in the management team and boards, no stranger to cycles. This is just another cycle. The main concern, I mean, there are many. Um, we'll talk, you know, commercial real estate exposure. You guys think it's pretty limited. I was struck by the fact that Goldman CFO the other day on the call said they've impaired their CRE exposure by, you know, 50 percent. So just being extremely conservative. Is that your experience as well? No, uh, we've actually had pretty good luck with CRE so far. And, and by CRE, I'm referring to investor commercial real estate. And I think some of the comments you hear from other players are due to urban concentration in towers where there has been understandably a lot more pressure due to the, the lesser number of people working in those buildings. Our footprint, uh, while we do have some urban areas, we really aren't much of an office tower lender at all. We have less than, than one hand of, uh, of projects on our books, all of which are extremely low LTC. That's really interesting. So let's talk about the impact higher yields have had. I don't know if you found yourselves in the same kind of awkward duration position as some of your peers or how you uh, made those decisions at the time about what to do with your deposit uh, explosion if you were among the many banks that had one. Uh, what's the status today? Well, that's a great question. Back when the pandemic was in its go-go days and the government was putting a ton of money in, we were a PPP lender uh, supporting our business clients. And and clients of other banks that opted out to, of that program. So we did see a huge uh, in, inflow of deposits, but but we really are a conventional bank. The company celebrated its 124th anniversary last week, so we probably got more than our fair share of deposit inflows. And at one point in time, the free money component of our deposit book was actually 50%. Wow. 50% of all of our, our deposits were in checking accounts. So those are our real clients. So uh, this third quarter, as we've seen the deposit cost increase mitigate a bit. We actually saw a pretty big reduction in compression in our margin. So I think we're beginning to see the coming out, the word, the wrong word of, uh, of getting better. We're beginning to see NIM compression ease. So the beginning signs of, of uh, NIM uh, stabilization. So what's the impact on the consumer, on some of the commercial business from higher rates? I, I have a hard time imagining that people can really handle 9 or 10% borrowing rates, whatever that figure is that would kind of help with your net interest margins going forward. I mean, it just, it seems difficult. Well, well certainly we've seen a dramatic uh, downturn in the amount of big ticket purchases occurring. We don't see nearly as many people doing uh, you know, large purchases like they did back in the days where average account balances were so high. A lot of that excess liquidity has already flown out of the market. And in reality, we see the summer of 24 is when deposit average account size balances begin to move towards pre-pandemic normal. So we're, we're probably at the third, late third quarter of the game in terms of getting uh, people back to a normal spending habit. But, but I will say this, Kelly, and I know you, you mentioned this on one of your shows prior, the bigger pressure on consumers are really more housing. Hmm. Um, housing costs have gone up tremendously. Um, and, uh, and there's a lack of, of affordable housing in the country that makes it difficult for people in the hourly positions to to house their families. So I think what we're, I don't think interest rates are as big a strain on the consumer right now as the cost of housing and insurance. Okay.